Hi guys, John Flores again, and Happy New Year. Happy 2024. I hope it's a great year for all of us. My heart and prayers are with you all. So, okay, I just saw a great new documentary called Immediate Family. It's from the producers of the documentary, The Wrecking Crew. The Wrecking Crew documentary centered around a group of rhythm players, LA studio rhythm players, who played on hundreds of the most famous records ever recorded. Well, so did the immediate family, but the immediate family was just slightly later in time than the Wrecking Crew. The two overlapped. The Wrecking Crew was still making the same records they were always making, but immediate family, these rhythm players came in and started doing the stuff that Warner Brothers is famous for, Columbia Records became famous for, Elektra Records became famous for, all of that started with kind of the singer-songwriter genre. Whereas the Wrecking Crew played on productions like mine that were very, very pop. Yes, they played rock. Yes, they played anything. They could play full orchestra Henry Mancini. But the records they played on for me, my three gold records, were quite pop, okay, pop music. The new era had begun, and it began with, oh, I don't know, Haight-Ashbury and the Monterey Jazz Festival in 1968 or 69, I don't remember which year, but the hipper artists were beginning to emerge, and they were singer, songwriter, solo artists, and bands. And when this genre came in and began taking over, and eventually did take over the record arena, these artists needed a different feel behind them. Could the Wrecking Crew have played on it? Yes, and they did play on some of these same artists. But I think it all began with Peter Asher, the famous, well, he was a singer with the group Peter and Gordon back in the Beatles days when the English music invasion took over the United States and the world. But then Peter went on to become one of the most incredible producers and artist managers that the industry has ever seen. This guy's near genius. So as Peter was moving to the United States, he kind of informally grouped these rhythm players together. This was not an existing band that played together. These were individual musicians that Peter started adding kind of one at a time or two at a time to his sessions. And then once he had his core, they played on nearly everything. And when I mean nearly everything, the industry producers picked up on who this great group was. It was back in everybody that Peter had, like James Taylor and Linda Ronstadt and a litany of fine, fine artists that he was producing. Others picked up on it. Lenny Warnaker. Lenny Warnaker and Warner Brothers, I would say, is a prime example. So Lenny produced James Taylor as well, but Gordon Lightfoot, Randy Newman, the Doobie Brothers, plus many more. L Lenny used these guys, and uh, I wondered at the time, I thought, who are these fellows that are the background players? So I started looking around, and there it was on the back of the Sweet Baby James album for James Taylor that Peter Asher produced. There were the musician's credits, and I thought, oh my goodness, these guys are great. The problem with me was I didn't make those kind of records, so I had no need for them. I just, you know, I told you before, I'm just terrible at singer-songwriters. My only major attempt at that was Michael Jarrett, and I don't think I did a very good job with his project. I did do a single session for Eric Anderson, and I didn't do a very good job of that either, so I knew to stay away from it. Let Lenny and the others just do their thing, and John, stick with what you know best. So that's what I did. Okay, so let's just look at how seeing this documentary affected me because it is, you know, I, I think it's an interesting story. The style of music that I grew up with, and let's just use Mamas and Papas and Gary Puckett and the Union Gap and My Friends of Distinction as an example. That was very highly produced pop. And as the hipper stuff came in that Warner Brothers specialized in, as did Elektra Records, which quickly followed Jack Holzman's label, all of a sudden, my style of records, who are Al Delores, the stuff from the late 60s, that was no longer the trend. We were fading out as the trend faded in and the trend stayed to this very day. So for me as a producer, would work have continued? 
Well, yeah, I could have produced 1977's You Light Up My Life with Debbie Boone. That's a John Flores type of song and production. And also David Foster produced We've Got Tonight with Kenny Rogers and Shana Easton, the duet, 1983. I could have produced a record on that. That's also my style. So let's just say that my career could have extended, hypothetically, to 1983. But really, my hit-making days were over in 1974. And if you're an independent producer living on projects that you're being offered, you're not going to be offered many projects if the style of music that you're doing isn't as popular as it once was. So I think I told you, after Rock the Boat went number one, I could reach people in my business network for about 90 days. They'd pick up the phone right away if I called them. After that, no. And it was hard to find work, particularly with the style of music that I did and the fact that I didn't do drugs and I didn't party and I didn't schmooze and I, I just didn't, as one executive said, play the game. John's good producer, but he doesn't play the game. Okay, in the meantime, well, here I am. I'm showing up in the latter 70s at Warner Brothers pitching new artists, seeing whether I could sell anything to get a gig over there. And Ted Templeman is driving down from Santa Barbara and uh, chauffeur driven <laughs> to, to the Warner Brothers building. And I'm driving a used import car. I remember Eddie Rosenblatt telling me, John, if you had your hits on our label, you'd be retired by now. Okay, also there's a stark contrast between this picture of the RCA building, which is stark and cold, and, and basically the group of us at RCA were on one floor of that building, the fourth floor. That was the A&R floor, but we were basically on one floor in this gigantic building. It looks like, oh, that's RCA Records. No, it's not. The fourth floor is RCA Records. Meanwhile, you go check in on Lenny and Ted and Russ over at Warner Brothers and look at the building they got and it's hip and it's gorgeous and that building is packed with Warner Brothers Records employees. The comparison is this, I get a laugh out of it. It's as if those of us, Al Delory at Capitol, Jerry Fuller at Columbia, and John Flores and Rick Gerard, we were attending here in Phoenix, we were attending Phoenix College. Here's a picture of that. Meanwhile, Lenny, Ted, and Russ are attending Stanford. Just look at their campus compared to ours. Oh my goodness. It was a country club for producers. And boy, I'll tell you to this day I'm envious. I would have loved to have worked there, but there's no way that my music would have fit in at all. And I don't believe attitudinally I would have fit in at all either because I was always just a naive little Phoenix boy who just showed up to the studio and went home to his wife. And I was never even really a fraternity guy, though I pledged a fraternity in college. You know, I wasn't the hi, hello, how are you? I wasn't built to be that kind of guy. And I didn't function well where I had to be social. Whoops. Now that's the sign of an introvert and what I did in the music business was an attempt to take the introvert and be more extroverted. I failed at that. I, I, I couldn't do that. So as envious as I am about producers like Lenny Warnaker, who, by the way, started producing before I did and was producing pop productions like Harper's Bazaar, Feeling Groovy, fabulous record. Thank you very much. I think that was 1967 for Lenny. And I started recording The Friends late 68. And then Lenny segued into doing singer-songwriters and bands and just and just went on forever. Now, I'm not envious of Lenny going up the corporate ladder and being a businessman because, and I'm sorry, I can't do my own books, let alone make management decisions. Oh, my. I'm just a humble little Phoenix pop boy that makes pop records for pop record companies. And I don't belong at Stanford. <laughs> I don't belong at the Warner Brothers Burbank campus. I just don't. But in my fantasies, I'd love to have been there. And then a few years later, they hired Steve Barry, and I thought, oh my God, he's a pop producer. They hired a pop producer. But by that time, you know, John, get over it, okay? Now, the other thing that this documentary strikes in me when I think about these players and Ted Templeman using these players is, okay, for fun, John, go on and Google Ted Templeman's net worth. 
Remember back in the 70s, he was coming down to Burbank in a chauffeured limousine from his place in Santa Barbara. I wonder what he's worth nowadays. And I Googled it, and Ted Templeman's net worth is $100 million. Whoa. Okay, let's wrap this all up. I highly encourage you to watch Immediate Family, great documentary on the rise of this rhythm group to play on the biggest hits of all time. <laughs> highly recommended. Don't think that I'm being sour grapes about people doing better than I did in the business or having more success or more money. I'm just saying it's interesting because I have spent the last 40 years being kind of a hand-to-mouth techie in multiple states. I've gone around and helped people, moms and pops, the small businesses with technology. And then I became a small business trainer. And then I became a corporate software trainer on the road in the US and Canada. And then I moved to authoring where I authored websites and multimedia software and flyers, brochures, all this stuff that I would design. And then I started this YouTube channel just to make my old stuff sound better and have kind of an ongoing living record of what I did back in the days when I produced. But boy, I see these guys, I hear one of the musicians with the immediate family telling his dad, he says, Dad, you don't need this big businessman friend of yours to support you anymore. I'll take care of you for the rest of your life. Well, it's true. And those are studio musicians. Imagine, imagine the money the artists made. P.S. Here's a little postscript. Peter Asher, bless his heart, one of the finest producers of all time. Peter Asher started out as a hit singer back in the 60s in England, came over, and then he did something we were not allowed to do when I was a staff producer at RCA and at Bell. He managed the groups that he produced. So he had full control and full monies from both venues recording royalties, touring royalties, and I would bet merchandise like the t-shirts and cups and all that stuff. Okay, we were not allowed to have that back when I was a staff producer. Once I went out and became an independent, I could have done that, but I didn't because I would make a lousy manager. But I did take on a small publishing company and we did cut a few of my tunes and that's as entrepreneurial as I got. Basically, I was kind of the odd man out in my industry because I wasn't social. I didn't aggressively look for work. All I did was occasionally call around to the people who were at the labels whom I had known over the years and say, you got anything for me? And usually the answer was no. So you say, boy, John's going to have some bad dreams over watching this documentary. Look at all the stuff it brought up. No, nah, well, I might. I, I do have... I do have I do have a continuing dream that I'm over at the Warner Brothers campus just kind of drooling all over it. Uh, and so, okay, I've babbled on long enough. And this shouldn't be about me, it should be about the documentary, but I'd rather share with you how the documentary affected me as opposed to the non-music industry watcher. It would be fascinating for me to talk to Rick Gerard, my office mate at RCA, or Al Delory, or Jerry Fuller and say, how did this affect you guys? Because we were all using the same players and they weren't these guys and we were all making much more pop music than what came to pass for the rest of our entire lives, you know. Uh, one could say, well, John missed the boat on that. No, I, I didn't miss the boat. I couldn't have done it. In my dreams, I couldn't have made as good a record as those guys made. Can't do it. Don't have a feel for it. No. Well, I hope you enjoy the documentary. I'm done. I'm going to have to edit the crud out of this puppy because I've said too much and gone way long. So, so as always, you guys take care. I appreciate you. Have a wonderful 2024, and I'll see you soon. Okay, you take care. Bye-bye.